Welcome to the October version of the Hornet Spotlight, and uh, we welcome everyone uh, to uh, this show. We are we're very happy to uh, talk about Beach Grove High School and and uh, some things going on at the high school um, right now. And for the sake of full disclosure, we must say that we, even though we're going to talk about our uh, Hall of Fame recipient for the month of October, we are still in the month of August, and we're just getting school started. And we have a, another out-of-stater who happens to be in town, and and we want to uh, make sure that we don't inconvenience anyone any more than possible uh, doing these things. But we have a uh, another outstanding, uh, as we did in September, we have another outstanding lady in the world of science. Uh, from the class of 1971, we have Patricia Abel Massimini. Got all that out correctly, right? Perfect. And we would like to congratulate you for being selected to the uh, Alumni Hall of Fame. Before we talk about her just a little bit, a reminder uh, that the Hall of Fame selection is made by the Renaissance Committee composed of, uh, we have eight teachers, actually we just had a meeting last week, eight teachers, four students, and two administrators and uh, from a long list of very exceptional alumni uh, we selected uh, Patricia to be our alumnus for October. Okay we mentioned you were from out of state you're, you're in visiting tell us a little bit about where home is and where you're at now and then we'll kind of regress from what I told you we're kind of going backwards from what we talked about okay. but where are you at right now so everybody know where you've landed okay so I uh, I have homes in uh, Virginia and Maryland uh, I work in Virginia so uh, and I have a, a condo just a couple blocks away from work very convenient in northern Virginia it's near the Washington DC area you don't want to live very far away from work because it could be an hour or two commute if you do but my heart is on the Chesapeake Bay, where we live on an airport. Uh, we have a really big front yard. It's a 300 foot by 2,000 foot grass runway. And uh, two hangars with airplanes, you know, fully stocked. Uh, and our home above the airplanes. And uh, that's, uh, that's really um, my heart, my retirement home, and where I do all of my hobbies. So uh, we get to do that three days a week. Okay. And, you, and you, you work in Washington or you work in the... I work in, in uh, just inside the Beltway of Washington, D.C., and uh, it's in McLean for a, um, uh, an R&D type firm, a not-for-profit not -profit firm that uh, supports the government. Okay. Um, obviously, even uh, right now, it's obvious to see that you have a lot of interests and a lot of uh, varied interests, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of these things <laughs> we have here as well. But when you were back at Beach Grove High School, back in the late 60s, early 70s, what kind of drove you to be interested in those types of things? You obviously have a very wide variety of interests, mm -hmm. and, and I know when we talk about your education, you have a, a very uh, exceptional list of accomplishments in the educational field. What, what set that in motion? Well, I think it always starts at home, and uh, of course it was my parents were, were really the starting point for all of that. Uh, Dad was an engineer, and uh, you know at the time there weren't a lot of uh, female engineers, so, like about none. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but I always aspired uh, to be the engineer. I think he was looking at my brothers who were next in line, you know, as being the guys who were going to take his place someday. But uh, didn't turn out quite that way. Um, so I was always inspired uh, by uh, Dad's profession and and Mom's talents and. Uh, they put a lot of emphasis on school. I uh, started school in the Beach Grove system at first grade and uh, went all the way through uh, graduating uh, from Beach Grove High School. And uh, I think it was a fine education. It was, um, it was just perfect. It prepared me in every way for all of my challenges later. And there were a few people who were uh, really an important uh, part of all of that. I was thinking, you know, what, what inspired you to the uh, to science. I think the, the key person for me was Mr. Jones when I was a senior uh, taught us calculus and uh, uh, he just uh, he challenged us all you know there were no limits as far as he was concerned as to as to what we could learn and what we could achieve so uh, I think uh, with his inspiration you know I went forward to Purdue and was you know really determined to prove him right that you know we could we could do this. Do whatever you wanted do to do. Do whatever I wanted, yeah. Um, 
you mentioned Mr. Jones and calculus. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many girls were in your calculus class? Do you remember? Were you the only one there? No, too? I think or there were. I think there, there were two that? others in my calculus class. Okay. I guess we must have been very progressive for that time because when I got to Purdue, there weren't so many. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and uh, uh, what types of sciences did you take here at Beach Grove? I know our science program is very strong now. Yeah. What was it like back then? It, it was good. It was really good. Uh, I took uh, all of them, biology, chemistry, physics, and then all the math that I could take. I must admit I wasn't real talented in chemistry. and burnt. I'm a little clumsy, <laughs> so I burnt myself. And finally the guys decided, my lab partners decided I could do all the math and they would handle all the equipment. And I think that was really the best for all of us. That was <laughs> so a pretty good deal. They, yeah, they were... Um, uh, they were more into sports, so probably it was just as well I was handling the math for them. <laughs> so, and nobody got hurt, which was even more important. And uh, I do remember, too, I, uh, uh, I desperately wanted to take physics um, because I was really trying to position uh, to move into, you know, some kind of science at Purdue. And um, uh, it was, it conflicted with the um, uh, third year French class that I wanted to take. And I was so disappointed. Uh, there was a uh, teacher, I think her name was Mrs. Thrasher, and um, she taught third year French and third year Spanish. And Spanish fit into my curriculum, although I'd never had a word of Spanish, and now I'm not so sure why that was true. That would have been much more practical, as it turns out. Um, but I, um, uh, she said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll teach you French if you just sit in my Spanish class, which was remarkably flexible, you know. Mm -hmm. and I said, well, sure, let's give it a try. And, of course, it didn't work because she's talking in Spanish. She doesn't really have much time for me. But what was just amazing was as I, I'm sitting in the back of the class trying not to pay attention, and they're doing conversational Spanish. And after a while, it just start, started feeling right to participate. And so um, she actually taught me third-year Spanish instead of French. And uh, that enabled me to um, just test out all of my Spanish requirements at Purdue so I could get more math in. So actually taking physics, not being able to take the thing I wanted was really good for getting more math later. <laughs> so okay. it all, all worked out great and a lot of flexibility from the, uh, from the teachers here. That's yeah. great. And, and you have mentioned a couple times you went to Purdue. Did you major in mathematics at Purdue? I did. I majored in math and physics. Um, but at that time, um, I, I, I was fairly actively discouraged from going into engineering. There just weren't really? any women in engineering. There was one or two women in chemical engineering at the time. Out of, what were there, 30,000 people at Purdue? <laughs> I mean, I didn't think that was, you know, a, a very big number. But, um, but I was strongly encouraged uh, to uh, pursue a teaching uh, degree, uh, so I did. Uh, so I did, a, I did math and physics just as the straight up sciences and then separately uh, got my uh, teaching certificate and taught in the Indianapolis school, or did my student teaching in the Indianapolis school system. And um, I was ready for uh, high school math and physics then when I was done. But um, I had the opportunity after Purdue uh, to take an engineering job and then pursue an engineering degree. So I was able to make the transition into engineering at the master's level, even though I couldn't quite do it at the graduate level. And thank goodness, things are so much different now, you know. Yeah. And that's why, Scott, you made a comment that you were discouraged uh, from the engineering area, but encouraged to teach. Uh, do you feel like they were discouraging you because they didn't want women in there, or they just didn't feel like you would get a shot if you did? I, I think probably the latter, and, and maybe Maybe there was a little sense, too, of I would be happier if I was teaching, especially if I were following a husband around to his mm -hmm. career, would be more flexible. And, and in fact, all of that would have been true. <laughs> you know? uh, it's hard to negotiate two engineering careers or, or an engineering career with, with somebody else's career. That's all tough. So I, I think maybe it just was the times, you know, that, mm -hmm. that was just a long time ago. And really at the at the beginning of the, the the big influx of women into the sciences and engineering and and now i know it's a much more even balance and and my do my daughter uh is a uh, a civil engineer now and uh, working at duke power and and she's just so proud of herself and i i couldn't be happier but i can say n that my girls have never um, seen and i, w I don't want to call them barriers i don't think there were barriers for me, I think it was just more discouragement, and mm -hmm. but they've never seen any of that. You know, it's it's always been a wide open world for them. So. Uh, 
you did you get your engineering degree at Purdue or did you yeah. go elsewhere? No, I did a Bachelor of Science uh, in uh, Math and uh, Physics at Purdue. And uh, I took one year towards an Applied Math Master's and uh, then uh, moved with my husband who I'd met at Purdue to Washington State. And uh, he was offered a job out there as a chemical engineer at the nuclear installation. And I just jumped at the chance, let's go. And uh, I got a job with Westinghouse Hanford as a nuclear engineer and then got my master's in nuclear engineering from University of Washington uh, at Richland, uh, Washington. So it was, a, it was a wonderful combination for me because it was all math and physics. I, I couldn't have been better prepared. Uh, for that degree. Another engineering degree wouldn't have made me any better prepared than I was. And um, I worked with people who were at the forefront of the nuclear business and uh, uh, it was just, uh, uh, worked with them and they taught the classes as well. So it was an ideal combination uh, for me and I enjoyed every minute of that. And, and what company did you say that was with? I was with Westinghouse. Westinghouse, Hanford. okay, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and you were in Washington for how long? Because I know you've been around. I've been, yeah, been around a little. Uh, Washington for six years, the whole time working for Westinghouse and um, was able to uh, complete the masters there and do some additional uh, engineering courses. Now I was trying to patch in all the things that I had missed mm -hmm. as an undergraduate, so electrical and mechanical and chemical engineering. Uh, but no other degrees there. And um, uh, while I was out there, uh, my, my husband died and uh, decided to make a big change. And um, by this time, I had been working in uh, uh, nuclear, I'd started doing um, advanced physics calculations and support for advanced reactors, but I got more and more interested in nuclear proliferation and uh, how to prevent it, how to make whatever those prevention mechanisms were fair and equitable and uh, I did my uh, my master's thesis on that and uh, got connected with a lot of interesting people in Washington as a result of that so I came back uh, to Washington then uh, to work in the area of uh, nuclear nonproliferation and uh, and that's where I got uh, my next degree in science technology and public policy at George Washington University so came back and worked for the uh, Office of Technology Assessment, which was a branch of Congress, now defunct. Uh, and we looked at uh, nuclear energy and nuclear proliferation, and it was uh, a fascinating couple of years. So that, that was really a fun time. And, yeah. and what was the timetable on that? Let's see, that was, um, let's see, 79, 81. I think I came back in 81. Okay, yeah. so there was, there was there was a real need for that at that time oh, because there. times were a little different than what they are now. They really were. Well, I'll tell you, um, for I, I I have kind of bad timing uh, that goes with the clumsiness, I guess. But the um, the uh, uh, I got my master's the the year I was awarded my master's in nuclear engineering was the last year that any nuclear power plant in the United States was ordered, and that record stands today. <laughs> 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 so there's some that are are sort of on maybe will be ordered if the uh, uh, permits are approved, but nothing's been ordered since then. So it wasn't great timing for somebody who wanted to commit themselves to a lifetime of uh, advanced development in the, in the nuclear field because there wasn't any and it was dying rapidly and uh, I could see that happening. So the shift to the nonproliferation area, that was a big area mm -hmm. and uh, there was a lot of activity with third world countries and um, so it was um, pretty fascinating. I worked with the State Department, Department of Energy and Arms Control and Disarmament Agency and um, it, it just, uh, it was really uh, uh, kind of a heady experience, you know, mm. and uh, I'm not sure in the end uh, what kind of impact it made because I think what made more of an impact is the nuclear business sort of fell apart, you know, oil prices went down. Uh, uranium prices went up and the, the whole thing sort of fell apart for a while so that probably had more to do with it than anything I did. Now was there a lot of travel or anything like that attached to that job or were you pretty much I traveled, tied to Washington? I traveled a lot um, and most of it was with my uh, the, the next job still in nuclear that I had worked for Office of Technology Assessment for a year or two and then went to work for the General Accounting Office. I think now they've changed the name to Government Accountability Office because nobody ever got it right. But <laughs> at the time we were still General Accounting Office and uh, another branch of Congress, again, you know, through connections I had made there. And um, 
uh, at that time, there was an intense interest in nuclear safety, uh, which is actually where I had started my Westinghouse career, so I was uh, well positioned for that. Um, they were starting to see it at Department of Energy facilities, which were uh, genera running reactors, generating nuclear materials, and then fashioning it into the weapons. Um, that there were some safety concerns and violations. And so GAO hired me as um, uh, their first, not female engineer, but engineer. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was really, cause they'd always had political scientists, um, uh, business people, mm -hmm. but never engineers. And uh, they began to understand they really needed the nuclear engineering background to go out and uh, do a credible job of, of working with uh, people in the field. So uh, that was wonderful. And I went to pretty much every Department of Energy facility. I got a tour uh, all the uh, reactors and w and of course while we were doing that Chernobyl blew and Three Mile Island and so uh, there was a lot of interest in safety at the time right so we were we were all over the place and uh, I got a hold a, 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 a hemisphere of a plutonium shell in my hands that had <laughs> come back from a weapons return and it was just uh, uh, there's just lots of really interesting things uh, with that job, so that was fun, and a lot of travel, and some overseas travel. You know, we did. There was a lot of activity in the nonproliferation community in uh, Paris and London, so I got to do a lot of European travel. And now, how many jobs away are we here? Uh, sorry, only oh, one more. Uh, your resume <laughs> has got to be a, a leather-bound edition. <laughs> um, after that, uh, it, what became clear at organizations like OTA and, and GAO is that. While they might need my expertise for one project, they weren't going to make a full meal of that. They had lots of other government agencies mm -hmm. to go annoy, right? Yeah, cool. <laughs> and so uh, they wanted me to work on Bureau, Bureau of Indian Affairs or something, which I was completely unqualified to do. And uh, so I was looking for a permanent home now. I was ready, really, to settle down. I bounced around every couple of years for a while. And I uh, uh, had discovered the MITRE Corporation as part of my journeys. and. Um, really like the corporation. It's a not-for-profit firm, uh, works in the public interest, and um, a very talented uh, engineering um, firm doing sort of the advanced research for government. And um, that was fascinating. Went there to work on nuclear engineering and did that for a while, mostly nuclear safety. Uh, helping uh, the Department of en Energy. Now that I'd been on the outside criticizing, now, now, criticizing, now I could go on the inside right. and help them out a little bit. Um, and then uh, later, as the nuclear work there dried up a little bit, I migrated into some other areas at MITRE, but I've been there now for 25 years. And uh, I knew when I walked in the door that this is where I would retire. Uh, it was just that good of a firm, and, uh, and I never, never have regretted uh, my time there for a minute. So um, I worked in nuclear. I worked in um, Superfund cleanup. We did a lot of projects there, and um, military uh, modeling military hospitals. And more recently, the last ten years, I've been working in aviation, uh, all kinds of things, airspace design, safety-related issues, next-generation technologies. So uh, that's been fun. So it's been quite a journey at MITRE. Does that explain the airport then in the front yard? Uh, it, the, the, the airport in the front yard is explained by my <laughs> current husband. <laughs> uh, we both have t-shirts that say my, mine says my next husband will be normal and his says my next wife will be normal. But I've, I've had him for almost 20 years. I guess Good we're going to stick for a while. But um, he, uh, 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 he, he was a marine aviator. Uh, he was an A4 pilot for more than 20 years and uh, retired from the Marine Corps and then came to MITRE. And uh, we had met at uh, George Washington University, where I got my doctorate. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I had uh, I was single for a long time, and certainly not looking for anybody. And about the last place you would look is at a George Washington University graduate degree program, <laughs> 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 because at that time most of them were 20 years younger than me and uh, barely spoke English. But um, I uh, did meet my husband there, and uh, it was uh, match made in heaven. And um, uh, he's, uh, after uh, he retired, I met him right before he retired, after he retired, um, uh, he bought his first plane and then a second one. When he bought his second plane, he did it without even telling me. And 
my neighbor called me down to her house uh, and said, come on down, you got to see something. I turned the corner and there was my husband, Vince, standing next to an airplane. And it has, he says, what do you think? I said, what do you mean, what do I think? He said, well, this is ours. I said, ours? What, what's ours, King Wasabi? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know anything about this. And he, the tail number he had selected, it was a new airplane, so he got to pick the tail number, was 91PV for 1991, the year we got married, Pat and Vince. Like that was going to make it that okay. Was make it, there you <laughs> go. I understand that completely. I don't know what's what's so. Uh, but um, we have a really good time uh, flying. We our children are in Florida and North Carolina and uh, uh, Columbus, Ohio. So we do a lot of traveling in the little plane and uh, get a chance to uh, and and back here to Indianapolis a lot. So it's one of the reasons I'm able to come back so often. Now, do you have a license as well? I don't. I took uh, ground school and uh, some pinch hit piloting courses just in case he drops dead of a heart attack. I don't have to go with him. Uh, <laughs> other than that, <laughs> other than that, actually, uh, a couple of years ago, he went to get his instructor's degrees, uh, and and it was a big commitment of time and money. And uh, when he was done, he said, "Oh, good. Now I can teach you how to fly." I said, "Well." I'm really busy, you know, I'm holding a full-time job, and we were teaching at the time, we teach graduate school, and I said, and, and I'm, I'm trying to quilt, you know, I'm really, really busy quilting. I said, tell you what, if you agree to become a master quilter, I'll agree to become a pilot. And you know, that was the last time we had that conversation, really? you know? I can understand <laughs> that one, too. I understand that one well, also. <laughs> yeah. um, you mentioned you're, you also are a professor. What university is that at? George Washington George University. Wa I, I kind yeah. of figured yeah. that we, was the case. We teach in the master's program. Um, we both got our doctorates in operations research. Uh, after I did my science, technology, and public policy master's at GW, I really wanted to go forward and I wanted to do more uh, technical work at this point. And I, I, you know, it was one of those, um, it would almost look like a TV commercial. I turned a corner. I was in the engineering building, which I had never been in while I was there because I'd been in the policy department. I w wandered into the engineering building to see, well, what do they have? I don't even know what their engineering programs look like. I turned a corner and literally ran into the head of the operations research department. We both dropped our books. You know, it was like that chocolate meets peanut butter thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he started, I said, well, what's operations research? I never even heard about it. He started explaining to me. I said, ah, that's it. That's what I was looking for. And I, I signed up that day mm -hmm. and started just a couple weeks later. So. Um, I turned out to be uh, a really good reason, a uh, good idea for a couple of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> now, just out of curiosity, do you feel like the students that you're having are coming in and and are are ready to go and no. are prepared? No, I don't. No, Talk I don't. Talk a little bit about that if you don't mind. It's the basics that they're missing. Um, you know, I mentioned Mr. Jones when I was here, and he didn't like teaching calculus to us. He said, "You don't need calculus now. You can do calculus when you get to college. What you need now." are the real fundamental things. You know, I want you to know algebra and trig and geometry, hands down, cold. So that when you're introduced to the, and I want you to learn how to think. And um, that's what I'm seeing with the people coming in. You know, they, they might have degrees, but they, they don't have the, the basic reasoning skills. And so often that's the first thing we have to teach. And, and it's a challenge. And it, the people, what, there's a couple of programs at GW uh, in their, uh, master's programs and one of them is focused on the um, uh, the local businesses who have I mean Lockheed Martin I don't know how many tens of thousands of people they have there or SEIC but they have their own program from GW that just move th because they can support full classes of, of people in these programs and so these are people very talented and obviously very successful they've been handpicked because they're on a fast track you know at these very good corporations and yet they're missing basic things. So it's, it's not just that uh, you know, we're seeing you know, maybe people who couldn't quite make it somewhere else. These, yeah. are, these are successful people, but uh, missing some critical reasoning skills. So, um. It's interesting. Um, we've we've kind of talked a little bit about your family. Let's, let's expand just a little bit on that. You mentioned we have, we're in North Carolina and Florida and, Florida and, and Ohio, Ohio and those are my kids all over. Okay. yeah my two sons and uh, four grandsons in Florida and a daughter in North Carolina and a uh, daughter with uh, uh, four children in, um, in Ohio so it's uh, uh, quite a collection they were all with us for fourth of July all in our airport house uh, 15 people sleeping in the house 
and <laughs> boy, was that fun. We had the, the, kid, the grandchildren are um, one, two, two, there's twins, uh, four, five, six, seven. So uh, it, was, it was a big fun event. Fun times. <laughs> a big event. Fun times yeah. for grandmothers. Yes, it was awesome. Yeah. Um, and uh, you mentioned you come back to Indianapolis to see family once in a while. Who, who do we still have here? Uh, my mother is here in Beach Grove. Um, so she's just living just a few blocks away from where I grew up and uh, next door to my sister and, um, and her children and husband and uh, another brother who lives right here in Beach Grove as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, then another sister and brother, big family, there's six of mm -hmm. us, another sister and brother in Indianapolis and a, and a sister in uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So we all get together as mm -hmm. much as we can. We're very close family. What, you've been, you were here a long time ago and, and you come back periodically. So since you come back periodically, it might not be a fair question to ask, but what do you see as some of the big, biggest differences in Beach Grove from now to 35, 40 years ago? Well, you know, it has been, I, I have seen it grown over, grow over time, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but it's a, uh, it's a more urban, more developed uh, area than when I grew up, clearly. But it still has a lot of its, you know, small town charm. I, I love coming back to Beach Grove. You know, but in Northern Virginia, you would not let your kids walk around on the streets by themselves or, you know, tear around like we used to as kids. And I hope some of the kids are still doing that because <laughs> it's so sad to see when everybody has to have a parent with them at all times. And but anyway, I I I think. Uh, uh, it still has a lot of its charm. Actually, I've been real impressed lately with how Main Street has spruced up and Emerson mm -hmm. Avenue. It's a, that's a really good looking. It's starting to look nice. Yeah. Um, you said you haven't been in the school for 35 or 40 years. What, 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 yeah, I mean, we haven't taken the grand tour yet, but what, what struck you as you came in? I was just amazed at the new entrance. I mean, that, I think the the old entrance I knew uh, is uh, was off to the side, and what a what a beautiful setup you all have here, and uh, it just the the whole area looks like it's thriving. You know, very good. Well, I think the last thing we want to do here to talk about, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about some of our props. I think, I think, Mr. Showalter, this is the first time we've had props, so <laughs> I'm going to let you describe. You have a huge hobby. I I, I cheated, <laughs> folks. I read a little bit about. Patricia before she came in and I know this is a huge hobby for you so I'm gonna let you I'm sure this will be f a fun conversation <laughs> so I'm gonna let you take it won't be a conversation I'm gonna <laughs> let you talk about your quilting skills here and some of the things you brought with it with you and and what we're looking at here well it started in uh, probably ninth grade I took a uh, home ec class here, and I'll okay. bet you don't even call it. No, that no, no. Now. <laughs> Family and consumer science. Do they even teach sewing anymore? Yes, we do, but awesome. we don't call it that. Oh, I've, I can't recall what we call that one, but it is. It, we so, do have it. So one of my friends um, brought her grand her granddaughter with her for a week, and she called it Camp Grandma Enhancing Domestic Skills. <laughs> 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 so I got to do that with my kids. Um, so learned how to sew uh, at a at a very young age, and uh, I had sewn all my life clothes you know it was sometimes it was just an economic thing sometimes because I wanted something a little special and never really thought much about it until I bought a new sewing machine that came with free lessons and I took my first quilting lesson I made a, a block that was eight inches by eight inches I thought oh that was fun and the next thing I made was a king-size quilt and I must have been out of my mind but mm -hmm. I was hooked and uh, now I, uh, I just was telling my mother this morning, she said, um, where do you find time to do all this stuff? She hadn't seen my, my little quilts. And I said, oh, you know, I just, I have to work it in weekends, nights. And she said, you, you need to take a break. I said, you're right, Mom. I said, I need to quit work. <laughs> she started <laughs> laughing. That wasn't what she thought <laughs> I was going to say. Um, and now it's, um, uh, it's just uh, uh, such a love. Um, I really enjoy it. So um, I'll show you a couple little things. Um, this is this is what my husband and I do together. There's a there's a series of five of these. I've got three of them here. Um, there's a uh, so a part of it. We're a quilter airplane combination, quilter pilot combination. Mm -hmm. And every year there's a gigantic air show at Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and you know just tens of thousands of airplanes fly in. He always flies his airplane there, and they have a quilt block contest, 12 inch quilt block, something to do with aviation. And um, uh, so he works with me on a theme every year. So I always try to do something that uh, has a historical reference. 
and um, I'll just show you a couple of them. This was the 40th uh, anniversary of the moon landing, and um, is that right, 40th? 1969. Right, right. That was the 40th anniversary of the moon landing, so that was fun. I always do a little bit of quilting, a little bit of embroidery, and do custom embroidery. This one was, this was 2008. I'm sorry, but I don't oh, mean to interrupt, but how long would it take you to do something like that? You know, uh, people always ask that, and, and probably the best response is, all my life. <laughs> 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 because uh, so much of it is in the preparation. So for this one, um, you know, we talked about the concept for probably two months, what we wanted to do. The digitizing the embroidery and sewing it out took me another month. Uh, just, you know, I, I work full time, right? So mm -hmm. I do it in the evenings. And probably the actual construction was only three or four days. And uh, so this yeah, was... Yeah. Now, I don't know if the camera can show it or not, but there's some detail work to this. It's not... It, it's, that's why I asked the question, because mm -hmm. there is some definitely some detail yeah. to that. Yeah, this one uh, won first place the year that uh, it exhibited in 2008, and it was the uh, 100th year of the flight of the Wright brothers near Paris, which is what the Little Eiffel Tower is for, and that's on French Dupioni silk, so they kind of mm. liked that, a little different, and that was really fun. And this, was, this is my personal favorite. I only won like a third place, but um, it's my favorite little Snoopy plane, but it was the mm -hmm. fastest racer. Uh, in the country for years, and it was racing the year the Empire State Building went up, which is why you see these motifs. And um, it, uh, uh, it, so many pilots died in it. It was um, not unstable, but a, a, a pretty dynamic, <laughs> stable mm -hmm. uh, airplane. And um, the uh, Granville brothers who developed it um, uh, destroyed all the plans and said it would never be built again. It was built again and uh, flown at Oshkosh. So that's where I learned to love it and um, made a little plane like that. And this year, I don't have my quilt from this year because it won first place and it will be exhibited for a year at the museum out there. So that's a lot of fun. And um, th there's others here. I'll, I, I probably won't go through those. Some of these are just, um, you know, uh, award winners from county and state fairs and that kind of thing. But this one, I would like to show you what we're doing here. Um, with that. Oh, okay, thank you. As you can see, there's pictures of a military family and the children. I probably should not have the name up there. And um, what this is, it is a service uh, from the uh, Armed Services YMCA allows any military family to apply for a quilt for their children if there is a service man or woman deployed to Afghanistan or Iraq. And so the family send in an application over email with a bunch of pictures attached to it. And um, they give it to us and um, uh, the YMCA photo transfers them onto fabric and then gives them to quilters who complete the process and send them back to the children. So in this case, it's the, it's the two little guys mm -hmm. will each get a quilt. I've made one for both of them. And I'll send those next week to them. We just finished this that one. We've done really neat. thousands uh, have been done by this organization. But I, I tell you, this is, I've done a lot of charity quilting, but this is by far the best because you develop such a personal connection with these people. And I'm Facebook friends with a lot mm. of them now, and, and I have a much better appreciation for their trials as they try to maintain a family life without a key part of it. Well, that, uh, that, is, that is neat. That, uh, that's really neat. That's spe that's special. Um, well, I'll tell you what. Is there anything you haven't tried? Oh, yeah. That you want to try? I want to try still everything. Left to do? I want to try everything. I just I've just had a you know a good a good career, uh, a good life. Um, I just I'm I'm very grateful for um, for the, the the strong educational foundation I got here and where it took me. Um, you know, one thing I, I've thought a lot about, so why was I in school for 32 years after all? <laughs> you, know, you might have thought, well, that sounds like she went to school her whole life. Mm -hmm. I did. I never missed a semester until I was 38 years old. And um, uh, on my graduation for my, with my doctorate when I was 38, uh, that was the day I got engaged to be married. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought, okay, now I'm done. I <laughs> truly am done <laughs> this time around. But um, what it what it did, the education itself was uh, an important part of the process and I enjoyed going to school. I met fabulous people there. I was enriched, you know, by it in many ways. But, but most of all, it, um, it opened up 
doors made me more flexible, right? I, I, as, you, as you just see different ways of looking things, you, you know that there's you know, many paths and, and no single path might make sense for you know, any individual. So what has happened through my career, I, oh, I, I have to tell you this. So when I first went to Westinghouse Hanford, my very first roommate, a lovely person, and, and I, I'm still quite fond of her, uh, but she made me feel so inadequate because there I was in my master's program, but not really sure where I was headed. I just knew that I needed to take the next step. And she had her entire life planned out. She knew she was married. She knew when she wanted to have children, when she wanted to finish her degree, when she wanted to start as a, you know, in a law firm, and when she wanted to be partner. And she achieved all of those things, but it really made me feel inadequate for not having that level of planning. And now I look back and say, I'm glad it happened the way it did for me because uh, I was able to, you know, very flexibly move from one thing to another. So I had all of those neat experiences. And um, uh, so I've, you know, been out in the field. I've been a manager uh, at MITRE. Um, they, yeah, they, they actually sort of tricked me into becoming a manager. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that kept going for 10 years until I had 60 people reporting. I said, that's, you know, that's just, quite a I'm trick. Out. <laughs> just, it was always, well, just until we can find a replacement. Uh, so I've had a chance, though, to experience that, too. And um, just by having a, you know, a good foundation and being really flexible, you can accomplish a lot and, um, and have a lot of fun along the way. I think maybe that's the most important mm -hmm. thing is to love what you're doing every day. And you can tell I jumped around mm -hmm. to a lot of different jobs. If it ever stopped being fun, I found something else. And, and you know what? Here's the other thing. I learned that every time you start something new like that, you are stupid. You are just stupid. I mean, you can't even, you can't, when I went over to aviation, it's like, what am I doing? You know, I have 15 years of nuclear engineering behind me, and I'm going to aviation where I know nothing. So it turns out I knew a lot. I just didn't know that at first. <laughs> all the math, all of the simulation analysis, all of the statistics, all of that, you know, conveyed. But, um, but there was a long period of time that I couldn't understand anything but the verbs in a sentence. You know, they talk in acronyms mm -hmm. or terms I didn't know. Find my way to the bathroom. You know, I don't, I don't know the associations with people. So y you have to be willing to just be stupid for a while and know that that's going to last for three or six months. That comes back yeah. a little bit to Mr. Jones there. Have the fundamental skills and then be able to think. And then be able to think. And, and that'll take you almost anywhere. It's, it's amazing sometimes. Um, obviously, you can see we, we have made another good selection, I think. We're very happy with, with uh, our process. We, we have some great ladies. We've had two great ladies already this year and, and two fantastic scientists. Uh, Patricia, we'd like to give you just a token of our appreciation and again congratulate Thank you, Thank you, you Randy. for being selected as the Alumnus of the Month for month of October. Uh, here at Beach Grove High School by the Renaissance Committee and we look forward to seeing you again next month on the Hornet Spotlight. Thank you for watching.